Um, a member of the Australian team that won the first ever game against the USA. If anyone's ever been to the States, that's like a Nepal team from America coming out and beating an Australian Nepal team. 1981 that happened with Jenny. A, a member of the 1986 World Champion Gold Medal team, captained Australia from 89 to 92, won a bronze medal at the 89 World Cup, coached the Australian team to a silver medal in 97. She captained or co-captained South Australia to 11 consecutive national championships. Woo! 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 So, when she'd had enough, but sort of had, you know, lacrosse, yeah, I might give pretty a crack. Quarter of us said 25 years ago, and this has become, you know, she is a founding mother of what we're experiencing at the moment. Uh, Jenny co-founded the South Australian Women's Football Association, which Gina Dutzkin, uh, the, the dairy medal equivalent now, is named after Gina, the Dutsky medal. She captained the first women's interstate match at Lanelle Gold in September 90. She won best on ground, of course. 2003, she was awarded the AFL Women of the Year Award for her contribution to the sport. Cricket. She, and I'm condensing this, understand. So, a wicketkeeper batsman from 78 to 82, South Australia. Key member of the national title winning team in 81. She was also selected for the national side to tour New Zealand, but I think it was lacrosse that might have kept out. You didn't go. Money. Always money. And I think it's one of your great regrets, isn't it? Not going? Getting a bag of green. So, she got the shits with all of those sports, then we thought soccer, yeah, I'll have that, give it that a crack. Um, so she played for a state as well between 80 and 82. Touch rugby, she captain coached the college touch, touch side to four league titles. Uh, she won the Association of Best and Ferris. Um, she was selected in the Australian squad for touch footy um, and was admitted, quite rightly, to the South Australian Sporting Hall of Fame in 2003. Well done. Yeah. Sorry, 2013. So, and, so I won't embarrass a bit anymore. So she's just she's published a couple of books. She runs a pretty nice little business from home, dealing with psychology and motivation and, and getting the most out of sports people. She's created Life, curriculum no. for schools. Support it. One thing I can um, personally, and Jenny's, you know, had a uh, lost a. A brother, a very dear brother, uh, some time ago in tragic circumstances. So she understands and more recently has dealt with her own issues health wise in regards to a breast cancer diagnosis. So I think she, she's aware of you know, some of the pain um, in the room, understanding around all that. So there's been some tragedy there amongst all those wonderful highlights. And my own experience with Jenny, I had a, a, a two years ago, a 14 coming 15 year old daughter, I'm sure a few of you in the room will understand. 14 and 15 year old girls, there's stuff going on, there's friend dynamics, there's family dynamics, there's weight dynamics, there's all sorts of stuff going on. So I had a daughter, but she was a bit unsure of her place in the world at that point of time, giving away all her sport. Thought she might give footy a go. We went down to West Adelaide one night to a training where my daughter Phoebe, and I'm with my other lovely daughter Millie tonight, thanks for coming. She, and so it's safe to say that a young 14 year old girl, pretty, you know, she's okay, but a bit mixed up, met Jenny, and in the space of six to eight weeks, that kid of mine was eight foot tall and bulletproof. So I have my own Jenny Williams story. Uh, my daughter plays her first game of league footy tomorrow for West Adelaide. So after two years. So we have a we have a, a saying in our house, and Jenny doesn't know any of this, mind you. 
So, and her tenure at West Adelaide was all too short. We have a saying in our house when things are, you know, what do we do? And I go to Peggy, well, what would Jenny do? And we move on. So, thank you for imparting on our life, uh, as, you, uh, as I'm sure you have done for many uh, in South Australia. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Jenny Williams. that introduction, so sorry for the long introduction. Um, secondly, I decided I could come here and sort of give you a rah-rah talk about you know, how good things are, or I'm a psychologist, or I could come here and actually talk about how we can actually make some change in our lives, how we can do really well, and how we can actually empower people to feel like, wow, life is actually worth being around all your friends, and uh, you're going to see by the end of it, I've got three tables of friends here that all came tonight to be here because that's what makes a huge difference in people's lives. And I put it here, hi, I'm Jenny, sit back, eat, drink and enjoy. And if I go too long, serve food, but I guarantee you walk out here, out of here with one or two new ideas that maybe will give you some ideas to change things that you do and hopefully have a really good time in life. So thanks, Elle. My book's called Think, Prepare, Play, I'm a Champion. Everyone says to me, oh, that's about being the best. And I go, no, champion is, my mum was a champion. She may not have been the best tennis player, but I tell you, she knew how to be a really good mum. And champions are people who sit at the end of the curve because they're different, because they actually try and find ways to be better. And as we're looking at this today, I have three things. A star. In your life, you're all stars. Every one of you is a star of some sort. How big or small you are depends on the people around you. It can depend on your coaches, your teachers, your parents, your friends. The feedback you get, whether you're great, whether people tell you how good you are, or people tell you how bad you are. It makes a difference. It can make a star shine, or it can make a star smaller. And last of all, something that people don't know, and I'm going to show you a few funny cl video clips, is how groups affect people is quite different. We often make, try and make individuals resilient, and that is great. But if you're under a system or a group of people who make life terrible, who you're around all the time, who beat you down, it is really difficult to do something about it. So we're going to talk about that tonight, and I'm going to show you a few things. First of all, this is my star. This is what make, might make up the star. And I'm going to ask you to think about how that makes up your life a little bit today. In it, there's things like mastery, talent knowledge, luck, motivation, thinking styles, and individual characteristics. And last of all, monitoring and evaluating and planning. Now, if you come to me and you wanted to be the best at anything, we'd go through each one of those and we'd take a long time. But tonight, I'm going to just talk about a couple. Thanks, so. First of all, in the middle of my star is this word care. Care. Three things about care. Care for others. Care for yourself and care for the result. And sometimes we have to vary that up. So in other words, if something's really important, yeah, you're going to care about the result. But I've got to tell you, as swimmers, put the next one, thanks, so. As swimmers, the same sort of people who were here tonight were there when I got in the Hall of Fame. You don't ever get anywhere alone. But this care about the result and care for yourself is important. But the swimmers do that. If you think about it, a lot of our Olympic players or our best people in individual sport have done that. They've cared about themselves and the result. And what happens is when you're 40, 50, 60, when you get that old, guess what? Your trophies don't bring you. Not one of my trophies has ever texted me. The Hall of Fame doesn't ring me and go, Jim, you're a good person. I've never even had a like on Facebook from one of those things. And the truth is... When you are old, no matter how many trophies you have won, the only thing that matters is who you did it with. Who comes with you? Who comes with you on the journey? So there are times when, for some people, I've got to teach them how to care about others. And what does that mean? That means when you go for coffee and you're around the local coffee shop, do you know the person's name? Do you ask, how's their day? My brother asked me one day, do you know everyone down at your door? And he goes, because everyone says hello. My husband and I will say, 
We've even been to the Korean wedding of the people around the corner because we say, how's your day? We know how to say gum sum da, which is hello in Korean. Guess what? If you want to be great, you've got to start thinking about if you wanted to come back, others. But for some of you, the care about yourself is also important. We forget some people don't think about that. And so, again, starting to understand this will give you an idea of which one you need to work on. And then I'm going to give you some homework, because guess what? You want to be great, we're going to do something different. Next one, Elle. Um, to understand, thank you, Elle, next one, keep going, one more, that's it. Luck! Oh, don't I love this when I talk to kids. Everyone tells them luck doesn't count, it's whether you deserve it or not. And I say to the poor people at some of the high schools down south where I taught, whose fathers kicked the crap out of them, as I would say, you unlucked into bad parents. You unlucked into that. I lucked into a mum that thought the golf hole was this big. A mum that when things went wrong would tell me, oh, I remember I was 5-0 down in tennis, Jenny. Oh, yeah, but I came back and won 6-5. That's what you're going to do. Makes a completely difference to what goes on in this little voice in your head. Makes a huge difference. So, again... Different forms of luck. Some of you have lucked into being beautiful. Some of my friends are the most beautiful people I know in every way. But again, kids that sit in my office often don't reflect on what things are good in our lives because we're often too busy thinking of all the things the other way. By the way, I lucked into being born in the luckiest month of the year if you want to play sport in Australia, and I worked this out when I was 13. When I was 13, I worked out I was lining up against every other kid in, I was in year nine, against every kid in year eight because I was born in January. <laughs> we get what's called the Matthews effect. It gives me an advantage. And I even said to my sister-in-law who was due on December 31st, sit, don't move, do not do anything. <laughs> and she goes, what are you doing? And I'm like, you can't have the baby until tomorrow, at least January the 1st. As if you can really do anything like that. But... Her son, when he turned 18 and got to play a second year in the under-18s, she said, now I get what you were talking about. It took 18 years for her to realise how wise I am. So, you know, like that sort of thing that happens. But we luck into who we meet. We luck into sometimes, ah, I didn't even know this. If you're lucky into a good teacher, you get 18 months of a curriculum in a year. If you're lucky into a poor teacher, you get six months. And it's got nothing to do with you. Same with coaches. You're lucky into a good one, wow, you get better quickly. You're lucky to a poor one? Ah, it really affects people. Thanks, Elsa. So just a quick bit about luck. Usually I show all these videos, but ah, next one I've got to talk to you about is mastery. One more click, Elsa, thanks. This is my wonderful daughter who's clicking underneath there for me. Um, again, like anything else, if things aren't exactly as you expect when you're presenting, find a way. Don't get too fussed about anything in life. Uh, this is really important, mastery. This 10,000 hours concept, this concept, except that my poor guy in there is Jimmy. Jimmy is in the blue. He's with Dan from the Dan Plan. Dan from the Dan Plan was an accountant and he never played golf. So he went into Nike and said, I want to be great at golf. And I've read this 10,000 hour thing. So you're going to sponsor me to do 10,000 hours of golf. And they said no. And so Dan was persistent and he went back again with more people. And so, so they said yes. Dan has just quit at 9,000 something hours. He's down to a handicap of around one. So he's doing really well. But I really, the sad thing for Dan is that golf is actually 17,940. Hands up those who play golf in here. Hands up those who get upset if they don't have a great round. <laughs> Hands up those who have done 17,940 hours of golf. When you've done that many, you have permission from me to get shitty when you do. But until you've done enough practice, now here's the interesting thing, dating. People think, oh yeah, oh, if you haven't done it much, you're not very good at it. And do not trust the experts on Married at First Sight. Come and see me, I've got a much better track record than they've got. But again, my whole thing is, you must understand, to be good at something, we need to practice, we need to get expertise. You can fast track the 10,000 hours by being with someone great. And I know a whole lot of good 55-year-old, like my brother Stephen, for instance, that is a brilliant footy coach. You know what he's doing? He's 55. He's not doing anything. Because people go, oh, they're too old. As long as blokes aren't grumpy, they are useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank 
Again, I will say that about blokes. I'm not being rude there. If you want to make young men good at footy or something else, and you can get someone to work with them, they get better quickly. But the people who are helping and grumpy, what happens is they make people actually feel like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. So it's really important. Thanks, Earl. Um, and this guy's name is Malcolm Gladwell. Let's see if we can hear it. Um, sorry, Malcolm Gladwell, is, this is the reporter. Let's see if we can hear just a little bit about this mastery stuff. And you talk about the, the 10,000 hour rule, that, that, that it's not just a matter of, well, this person's a genius, this person has an amazing ability. It, it is actual practice and hard work. Yeah, so a bunch of group of really brilliant psychologists in the, in the field of expertise research have sat down and tried to figure out, how long do you have to work at something before you become really good? Right? And the answer seems to be, it's an extraordinarily consistent answer in an incredible number of fields, and that is, you need to have practice to be apprenticed for 10,000 hours before you get good. So, every great classical composer, without exception, composes for at least 10 years before they write their master. Mozart. Mozart is, is composing at 11, but he's composing garbage at 11. I mean, he doesn't produce something great until he's 22 or 23, and Joe number 9, I think, is the only if I asked you how long it would take you when you were doing this job before you felt comfortable and good at what you were doing, the same with me, right? It's an incredibly consistent finding here. It's really important. Okay, so, Alice, we've said maybe we can find some expertise. There's a whole lot of other things I can tell you about motivation. But it doesn't matter how much you want to do something, you've got a trigger, you've got this, oh yeah, I, I really want to do it. But if we make it too hard, it becomes hard to do. So again, the greatest coaches can work out what you're not doing well and cut it down. The same with people who are teaching anyone. How do we actually make it easy so we give people steps to get better, rather than just say, do it better? And in people's heads, this might be the hardest thing if you can't see, but please try and have a look at this, because this is, on the outside, there's... Thanks, Elle, next slide. On the outside, there's this. People look like this. This is my cupboard at home. Everyone looks like a superhero on the outside. Look at you, you're gorgeous. Look like a superhero. Okay. Muscly, tough, strong on the outside. And people even put them in leadership groups. They say, oh, look at you. You're a god. You must be in the leadership group. But on the inside, thank you, Elf. On the inside, people have two different things and a mixture of them. One is Tigger and one is Eeyore. Start to think which one maybe you're going to be. And remember, it can change a little bit. But here's what happens. Thanks, Elle. There's a thing in the world. This is me. I'm Tigger. Have a look at this. I play... We won an important game. My friends will recognise this. We played an important game. I played well. I knew I could. I'm really capable. Okay. Confident, pride. And after a game, you'll find walking tall, hopefully humble. Sometimes there's arrogance, sometimes there's joy. And most of all, at the end of the game, these people will be able to tell you, when we've won, I will be jumping around on the dance floor like an idiot. And everyone goes, Jenny's had a few. I don't drink, but I look like I do when I dance. Or I'll be sitting in a chair going, ooh, that was enough. When we need to an important game, before a game, I am thinking, I will do this well. I know I can. I'm really capable. I see and I feel excitement and anticipation. Even coming to talk to all you people tonight. For me, this is like, wow, how good is this that you can get to this many people? It's much better than one-on-one -on -one psychology for me. I was a teacher. This is an opportunity to teach. And again, so I'm excited. I anticipate things are going to be good. I want the attention. I'm quite happy and I can talk. And in a game, that's really hard. If you have a dry mouth because you're nervous, you can't talk. And every coach says, are you talking? That's the first thing they say. So here's the Eeyores now. Can I please tell you that Eeyores are equally good, if not better, players? Equally good, if not better, but they think differently. Eeyores, what an important game. Oh, my opponent wasn't very good today. I was lucky I didn't make so many mistakes. Notice Tiggers don't listen or think about mistakes. Eeyores do. Big change in how things are. Relief, pride, and feeling a bit of guilt because they remember those mistakes. Walk a little taller and some people celebrate, not because they're going out in one, but because I'm feeling a bit guilty. They want to douse the, the voice in their head. 
So, they need to win an important game. Eeyore's going, I hope I play well. I don't want to make mistakes. I hope my opponent's looking strong. I hope they have a bad day. Ah, they get fearful. They get dread. And what happens is, inside their head, they start to look small, feel really small. They can't talk. And they have the following. Nervous number ones. Nervous number two. Check out your change rooms before you do anything. The number of people that are lined up. So, nervous or going to the toilet, um, breathlessness, heart racing, all of that are signs of feeling uh, before a game. Now, can I tell you one thing? If you watch the pros or the power or any of your teams, and they've got a big game, and some of them have spent the night before being nervous, some of your guys are there, 60% of people sit here. And what happens is, this has been happening in their hearts all night, they go to bed, they wake up, still happening, they walk out on the ground and they're exhausted. And everyone says they're not fit enough. It's got nothing to do with fitness, it's got all to do with how we're up here thinking. So Ellen, let's go. These are even more important. And if you're a young bloke in the room, please have a listen. Because this is you, I'm saving you $500 from coming and seeing me. So have a listen. Lost important game. It, tickets think I played okay. Conditions didn't suit us. Oh, guess what? We had an off day. Tiggers make excuses. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Tiggers make excuses. They'll also be intense, defensive. They laugh it off. They be aggressive, agitated or angry. Next time you play them though, Tiggers will say, we'll get them today. Now here's the key that I want you to actually take out of this slide. Tiggers will say, I am so much better prepared than last time. So I'm going to ask you to adopt a Tigger attitude here for one thing. My Tiggers and my Eeyores even learn one thing. One excuse, two new plans. One excuse to feel strong in yourself. Doesn't matter what the excuse is, but two new plans to get better. So I tell a story about my husband and I playing golf with my brother Mark, and I'm playing great golf, going straight down the middle, and of course they stand behind me, and as soon as I'm about to hit it, whack. They yell out, scream, and off it goes down there. So I turn around. What would my excuse be, you reckon? What's a good excuse if someone's been standing behind the other man? You put me off. Thank you. Somewhat like that. You put me off, except I use slightly different words. <laughs> to which my brother Mark goes, my brother Mark goes, you and your excuses. But think about it. I'm a star, like anyone in here. If I go, I'm terrible, I can't play, my star gets smaller. By the time I walk over to play my shot, my star is smaller and I can hit the ball as well. Make my one excuse, you idiots, it's all your fault. Get over there and make two new plans. The two new plans are, number one, turn my visor so I can't see them. And number two, in my head I'm singing, da 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 Bubba Watson. That was the Barbara Streisand song we've done with Bubba Watson, who's a great golfer. And it goes down the middle again. So, it is a protective, but also, if you make the two new plans, it makes you better. So it doesn't give you just excuses. Uh, by the way, back to being excited, back to me to talk. Tiggers, by the way, with one G are tigers. If you've ever come across a tigger with one G, I would give you an example, would be Donald Trump. Tigger with one G. Excuses, lots of them. Not necessarily a lot of new plans. But what it says there is, tigers without empathy are tigers. Tigers can bite and destroy other people. Be very careful if your boss, your coach, your teacher is a tiger. Because they will make excuses. They will say, it's all your fault we lost. And I go, but isn't that an excuse for you? Oh, I don't make excuses. So again, start to understand how we think. This is how Eeyore's thinking. It's really important. Next one, else next. Eos lost an important game. My opponent is too good for me. I made so many mistakes, it's my fault. And last of all, no one thinks I can play. They get guilty, they get angry at themselves quite often, and the worst thing they get is despondent. Despondent means I am actually starting to think I can't control this. Things are just happening to me. They withdraw, they lose self-confidence, they only see or hear about mistakes. So if you're playing for the pros of the power and you're from interstate and you come over here and you're living with a family that just thinks about footy and all they do is want to know about your footy game and tell you about that and things go wrong, 
And all the time at footy you're being told you're not doing very well, even the parents don't recognise their own kids when they go home. They start to actually go, what's happened to my kid? They were a bright 18-year-old who went over there and where have they gone? And this is really important. They drink and some of them take drugs because the voices in their head are telling them there's things wrong with them all the time. And it's not fair and it's not how it should be. They get sick and the next time they play them, they're already thinking, I don't want to do this. This is embarrassing. I'm not going to be very good. What if we lose again? And they feel helpless and dread. One of the most important things I usually say if I'm doing a talk you're pretty lucky tonight because I'm not pointing at people and saying, what do you think? Guys at the back of the room would be going, oh my God. But I like to ask people, what do you think about this? And if they give me an opinion or an answer that's not necessarily correct, I, we go, go again. Mistakes have to be part of your life. Everyone in here has to understand, to be psychologically healthy, you have to understand mistakes are part of what we do. What we do is how do we do something about it, but to be great, you've got to make a mistake. Thanks, Elle. So, one excuse for your confidence. Two new plans to get better. So no coach, no parent, no one can ever actually doubt you if you go, yeah, that happened because of. Oh, I didn't do too well tonight in that exam because uh, I wasn't feeling well. Teacher didn't teach me very well, can be any of those things. But the two new plans then are, oh, maybe I need to find someone better to help me, or maybe I need to actually study a bit more. But again, it's actually paired with something to make us better. Self-compassion, what it just says there, I really want you to know. Self-compassion, being nice to yourself, means you will try harder and longer than anything else. So in other words, being nice to yourself and going, oh yeah, bad luck, it didn't work. If you don't do the new plans, you won't get better. But if you do that thing, one excuse, two new plans, I promise you, life will improve. Okay, next one, Elle. Um, talent knowledge. Every young person should be taught to critically think. Instead, we give them work to do. I heard a, a person say the other day, we're actually making kids dumber sending them to school. I've got to tell you, my friends in here who are teachers do not make people dumber. They are great teachers because they actually want kids to learn. Uh, what you see is all there is. A guy named Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize. He's an old psychologist for economics because he says, you people all act like a herd. People will do what other people tell them without asking. Uh, regression to the mean. If you do what everyone else does, you're average, which is okay sometimes. But if you want to be great, you can't be doing what you were doing last year. You've got to be doing better. And you need to understand that. Ah, one well, excuse to new plans. Next one, opinion versus expert opinion. Everyone has an opinion. It doesn't make it right. Only listen to experts. And that means when you read Facebook or Instagram, work out how much do they actually know about things. Because if they don't know and you're following them, you will actually find that your life will get worse because they tell lies. Experts are people who have done 10,000 hours in it, but they've also got feedback. They're pretty good at it. So I think I'm a pretty good coach. When I hear a story like that, that almost makes me cry because guess what? I'm actually doing what I would like to do in people's lives, making people feel like they can play. So again, getting feedback is important and most of all group behaviours. Talent knowledge, knowledge is actually power, but awareness does not change behaviour. All of these awareness programs are not helping unless we give people things to do and they know why. Okay, here is a word that I would like you to all walk out and know what it means because hands up those in here who basically know what this means. I had no idea until I asked my husband one day, darling, why did the clothes all end up on the floor in the bedroom? Does that happen in anyone's house here? No, you're all neat and tidy. Mark said to me, Mark said to me, this is entropy. And I'm like, what's entropy? And he said, it's the full floor of thermodynamics, and I think it's the second when I looked it up or whatever. But the basic thing is, if we put no energy into anything, we it goes to chaos or to the lowest form of energy. So when we do all this awareness training, you can walk out here and go, gee, Jenny told me some great things to do, and this is why you need to know about bell curves. Feel free to go outside and 
want them chat. Yeah. I, never get, I never get mad at kids. If they want to do something different, that's fine. Because that's your prerogative. But if other people are trying to listen, as I would say in my... I taught at Sacred Heart. There's a few Sacred Heart people here. I don't know about well, it. Well. <laughs> but I would have said, at Emmanuel, I would have said to them, in my year 11 class with boys, a couple would come in on Monday mornings and they'd go, no, 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 because they were car racers. And they had to talk about car racing. And all I'd go is, fellas, corridors out there. And they'd go, who swears we'll get in trouble? And I'm like, no, you won't. I'm giving you permission to go out there and talk for 10 minutes if you want to, because everyone else wants to get better and you want to talk. That's okay. Remember, this is, if we're going to be good at things, we can't get mad or annoyed. But again, when people ask, I'm saying, if you don't want to listen, that's fine. Like anything else, people have a prerogative to decide to or not. But if you want to be great, you probably will. Woo! <laughs> um, the reason the bell curve is important is a bell curve is just a distribution of normal. In the middle, the green are normal. When they hear a good talk or ideas or awareness training, the number underneath is zero. That is the number of things they do differently when they walk out. Why? Because we get busy, we get other things happening, we forget to do it. So I'm saying if you want to improve, do one thing differently when you walk out here. Maybe even think about that one excuse to new plants. If you want to really improve, do two things. If you want to start moving right up the curve to where the X is, where champions are, they always do three or four things. And again, this is one of those areas that I'll go, your choice. But start understanding that things are not so bad as people think if you can find people who care, who want to help you and make it easy. Again, Elle, please one. There's a thing called cognitive behavioural and silly psychologists call it therapy. How many men want to do therapy? No. So we call it cognitive behavioural training. All right? Training is the same for the mind as it is for the body. If you actually, you're, whether you're a tin or an eel, is a lot to do with what happened. What number you were born in the family, whether you had good or bad teachers, whether you unlucked into someone who was around you that wasn't very good for you. But we can change how you think, how you feel, or how you behave to actually help you. You have to decide which one and have which ideas. Now I'm going to show you a few songs later on so that you listen to the words. I'm going to ask people to go out and think about making a tape things differently. One of my uh, elite cricketers, one of my Australian cricketers, he um, has actually got into cruise 1323 because he was getting a bit annoyed in the car. So I said, well, you can't get annoyed if you turn cruise on because it's actually got really slow or tuneful songs. And he goes, we now do the secret sound. And I'm like, oh, that's gone to the next level. But again, I need to actually say, normally if you were coming to me, I'd teach you how to do a relaxing breath. And we'd all practice that too. But again, these are things to say, do you want to change behaviours, do we want to change thinking, or do we want to change how we feel? We can change any of those three things and actually impact on you. But again, you need to know what and how. Thanks, Al. So, the Resilience Project, I was listening to it on the radio the other day and I thought it was great. But, the Resilience Project says three things make kids resilient or adults resilient. Everything. Yes, my team, you have everything. This group are fantastic with that. Gratitude, yes, saying please and thank you. Absolutely it does. And the last one's mindfulness, being able to stay where you are, thinking just nice and easy, being able to plan things just gradually. Great idea. But I said underneath, have any of them ever met a psychopath? Because psychopaths couldn't care less how much empathy you have, how grateful you are, or how nice you are at staying where you are. They will pick on you. So I think the other thing that's missing is understanding group behaviour because, here's the thing, if I pick on you, shockingly, most of this other table is going to shut up. Not because they don't like you, because they're going, thank God I'm picking on her. <laughs> you actually need to understand group behaviour because we keep trying to make people resilient one at a time. And I need to tell you, it is about groups, it is about how we understand behaviour, and it's about how we have a seconder. And you two might get together and go, Jenny's actually picking on her, we're going to say something. But you can't just be alone. Because if you do it by yourself, these other people will go, oh, no, I'm not getting in trouble for that. So again, group behaviour is something we, know, we don't teach, we don't look at, 
And there's some amazingly fun site experiments that if you want to look them up, Milgrams is one of the most important and you'll understand why the Essendon guys took the drugs. And it wasn't their fault. It was not their fault. If you are under, if you are under control or duress of a boss and that, and they say you must do this, everything it takes, your chance of actually saying anything about it is really, really minute. And Milgram's experiment showed that 70% of you people in the room continually would electrocute people through to death if you were under an experiment when someone said you had to. And the reason you're not allowed to do Milgram's experiment anymore is that 70% never believed they would do it and it actually stuffed them up afterwards. So again, it's an interesting thing. But psychopaths, Psychopaths do not care about how you feel. They do not care. They will actually work out who is the weakest person on the table and I'm going to pick on them because it will make me feel better. This is the mean girl stuff that goes on at school and it's the reason the other girls know there's something wrong but they actually are afraid and there's nothing wrong with that because it's normal. So, I think there's also a need for self-strength. You need to check on your own behaviours. Do you have empathy? Do you have gratitude? And are you good at what you're doing? Then if you are doing those three things, the next thing you need to have is that I am here, I am valuable, and I am allowed to have an opinion. And if you don't like it, Frank Underwood you. <laughs> Anyone who ever saw House of Cards, and I, um, unfortunately Kevin Spacey's um, behaviour has been terrible. But in the series, if you watch the English one or read, um, Frank Underwood's initials are? F you. Yeah. And you need to actually understand, you don't need to say it to someone else, but if Mark is picking on us and Meredith and I go, he's an idiot, he's a dick, don't listen to him, together with each other, we are actually creating a lot bigger resilience than if we actually just stand there by ourselves and don't say anything. So this need to value yourself is really important. You, if you have those other things going for you and you're getting picked on, start to understand you deserve to be uh, looked after and you deserve to actually be able to say they're an idiot. In your head, whatever. I will give you an example. I've even had elite level players whose coaches pick on them all the time and we call this, and apologies for the language, but we say that your coach is an asshole. And when they're picking on you, you're just going to do this with each other. And they do that. And it's hilarious because no one else knows, but they know we're strong together and it's not going to hurt us. You need to understand that to be strong, you need to be able to actually articulate in your own head that you are valuable and they cannot penetrate how good you are. And next one, Elle. Oh, by the way, this is a, I just want to show you some group behaviour stuff here. This is Ashes Conformity. The ASH experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in a real test, which is actually about group conformity. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example... The actors have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is to... Uh, one. 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 Two. One. <laughs> Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 <laughs> the Ash experiment has been repeated many times and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. We're very much aware of what the people around us think. Uh, we want to be liked. We don't want to be seen to rock the boat, so we will go along with the group. Even if we don't believe what people are saying, we still go along. One. 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 
Now, group dynamics is one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. Uh, one. The Ash experiment. Thank you. <laughs> um, that is an experiment that they repeated and repeated, and he just said a need to be liked and to be conformed will make us actually go along with things that aren't right. Here's another one that's interesting. For those of you who saw um, Focus, it's a movie, and Marco Robbie is asking um, Will Smith, thank you, uh, is asking Will Smith, how did you get him to do that? Well, what they're talking about is a high roller has gone along and Will Smith has convinced him that he's going to bet him it's now up to, I think, $3 million. And all that he has to do, Will Smith, to win the money is pick the same person that the guy picks out on a football field. And he gets it right. And Marco Robbie wants to know, how did he get it right? Now, I'm showing you this. This is a thing from a movie. But if you go and watch any of The Illusionists or that at any of the fringe shows, this is how they work. But it's also how your mind works. And it's also why what you put up around you, what you read, what you see every day, what's on your fridge, what's on magnets, anything like that makes a difference. So thanks, Elle. How did you do that? He bets on everything, any huge cash bets all the time. Once the Bellagio put Bill Gates out of the high roller suite because he didn't want this fight. He is the perfect fit. How did you know who he was going to pick? We told him to. We tell him all day. From the moment he left his hotel room, we've been chronicing him, programming his subconscious. He's been saying the number 55 all day long. On the elevator. In the lobby. Even the stick man on the doormat. Not only that, we loaded his route from the hotel to the stadium. He looks out the window, primers are everywhere. Now he doesn't see it, but he does. There's no getting around it. He even sees far out. Suggestions are everywhere. And the number of flowers in the face. And it's not only what he sees, it's what he hears. The Mandarin word for five is Wu. There are 124 Wu Wu's in sympathy for the devil. Now he's not registering it, but it's all there. So he picks up those binoculars, he looks out on the field, sees a familiar face with the number 55 on his jersey, some little voice in the back of his mind says, that's it. And he thinks it's intuition, and he picks. And again, as I said, that's a movie, but it actually describes the psychological phenomenon. So think about, what do you see every day? What is around you? What words are on your wall? And if you saw um, our house, I've got a big thing up with family, dogs, all of these words that actually make us feel great. So again, doing, I'm a psych who follows my own advice. I promise I do. And that means understanding priming. Also, by the way, what colour are your walls? See, our house is actually full of colour. Children's hospitals are full of colour because they make people feel better. And then we become adults and we paint everything that colour. And we wonder why we lose some fun in life. Thanks, so. How did you do that? I was doing an amazingly good job here. Now, just in case you thought the ash experiment wasn't right, I thought I'd just show you this one because I want you, if you ever have an opportunity to do something like this, have a look at it. This is a woman who goes into a dentist's office, and all she's doing is sitting waiting, and they start ringing a bell. Have a look what happens, and work out what you think you'd do. To answer that question, we set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone, simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this, or would you? Just three beats, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the group. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Now 
Now she's alone. The crowd is gone, and nobody is watching her except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? She's conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat, and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Thanks so much. She'll teach the new guy what to do. <laughs> we kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. Patient. 
Um, I'm going to finish off showing you some music in a second, and I would like you to make four types of music if you have time. One music is fun. One music is when you are not feeling good, you must have an up music. People who aren't feeling good play music that actually, guys, sorry, fellas at the back, I did say, head out if you want to. Um, no, 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 I don't mean to make fun of everyone. I'm just saying this is so important to me because we are here for a reason tonight and the reason is people need to know this stuff to help them feel better, to actually understand how life is good. I have the best bloody life because I don't think I know everything and I listen to new people who give me good information. So, I am saying to you, if you have time or you can, please make a couple of different types of music. And one of them has to be when you're not feeling good, your brain is actually repeating that continually. You need to actually have up music then. Music that has words that tells you you're going to be fine. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples just to finish with. Have random conversations with others. Share experiences, food with friends. Every time you get a chance, doesn't matter what it is, tea every week on a half price meal, it makes a difference to people. Turn up your determined and value control. You are valuable and be determined that people will treat you such. And last of all, if you can afford it, buy my book. I'll always give you ideas because it's got checklists in it for things to do and you won't remember most of this. Ellen, next one. And just to give you an idea, these are songs that the words are really important. Have a look at these are men all singing. And they are singing a song that is from a musical called Carousel. And it says, when you walk through a storm, hold your head up high. So I'll just play you a second of this. But have a look at the words. It, it's really important. Thanks, Earl. So. today. i 
song of how to be great as a group.
Let it out, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Yeah, we'll just thank you. That's it. You've you probably heard your stories about the cross and footy and all that. I didn't expect it again, Jihad. Fantastic.